Hi, my name is uh, Paul Humber and I live in Philadelphia and this is the 5th of uh, November 2018, a day before a midterm election and my wife and I are on duty to put in about 14 hours tomorrow at uh, serving as uh, inspector or clerk or whatever. But today I want to talk about evangelical and reformed Christians traditionalists, they err in their traditionalism. Jesus uh, talked about traditionalists, the uh, people who had traditions. And uh, believe it or not, even though I have a warm place in my heart for evangelical, because uh, I've been an evangelical since my conversion 68 years ago. I'm 76 now. And I also uh, uh, went to Westminster Theological Seminary, which is definitely Reformed. It's, it, you know, in Glenside section, and I really enjoyed my time there. Uh, so I'm not really trying to be uh, critical and so on, but that doesn't mean that Evangelical Christians or Reformed Christians don't have a problem with a traditionalistic view, a traditionalism. Uh, tradition uh, is not necessarily good. And uh, I believe definitely they err in one particular area, especially. Uh, the Bible, Polycarp, and Justin all have been mistranslated with respect to the two words uh, Ionius Greek and Olam Hebrew. Okay, recently while reading through the martyrdom of Polycarp, and I give the reference there, I noted an ongoing problem. The English translation has Polycarp speaking of, quote, everlasting punishment. The word there is Ionius punishment. So is everlasting a, a good translation? I believe that it should be lasting punishment, and I want to say more about that. Polycarp spoke this at his martyrdom, and the original Greek was Ionius when the Greek word is clicked uh, on the website, it gives the translation as being lasting for an age. This is exactly right. And the mistranslation, everlasting, is in error. And I'm going to prove that. My concern is that English translators once again bypassed the correct translation, lasting for an age, or simply lasting, and opted instead for the significant mistranslation also found in Matthew 25, the King James. And so there's a tradition, it's not only King James tradition, it's, it goes right back to Roman Catholicism and their traditions, and we all know that some of their traditions were to be uh, turned away from, you know, Tetzel and the paying for indulgences and so people can get out of hell and all kinds of nonsense like that. And even today there are problems with Roman Catholic confessional and, and uh, the Mass, uh, supposedly a re-sacrifice of Christ Jesus said once for all. So the word ever is wrongly added to lasting. Now, the word lasting doesn't necessarily mean less than, than uh, eternal, but it is indeterminate relative to duration. Both, in other words, are aligning with Tertullian's conjoining of sacred text, he was around 200 AD, with Platonic poison. Plato uh, affirmed the idea of the immortal soul. And uh, the soul is not naturally immortal. Adam and Eve lost any potential for immortality uh, when they sinned and they became mortal. Uh, so Tertullian explicitly, he said, referred to Plato explicitly, and I can give you that reference. And he uh, it was promoting the false Greek notion that the soul supposedly is naturally immortal. The soul of man has to go, whether it's in hell or heaven, that kind of argument. And it's not from the Bible. Now, we, including our souls, are emphatically mortal. 
immortality comes only as a gift from Christ, who alone has natural immortality. Uh, I hope I didn't go uh, too far there. Let me just check to make sure. Right. Okay, I'm coming back. Sorry. Now, where does it say that only Christ has natural immortality? 1 Timothy 6, verse 14. Speaks of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ and then refers to, quote, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality. Peter, uh, Plato thought that he had immortality naturally. He was wrong. And we don't follow Plato. No mere human has natural immortality. God alone is immortal. However, God the Son imparts immortality to all in him as a gift. If you read 1 Corinthians 15, he, we put off mortality and put on in, immortality, and so on. Put, we put off the perishable and put on the imperishable, and so on, near the end of 1 Corinthians 15. Thus, we should not listen to the Platonic lie that the soul of man is immortal, or to the Satanic lie of Genesis 3, 4. Instead, we should get our instruction from the Lord and his true followers, such as apostles and so on. Now, before talking about uh, Justin, Justin Martyr, I've already referred to Polycarp. Some may think Ionius means, but Paul, Ionius means eternal, everlasting forever. No, it does not. And uh, I've got four publications out there. Two of them are free. I'm not trying to make money. And if you contact me, and there's contact information later on, I, I, I'll give you these books free. I, yeah, I'll lose money. I want you to get this. I want you helping with this juggernaut for 1,800 years. Uh, and we've got to get it right for Jesus. Because if we love him, we should love him with all our mind and so on. Uh, truth needs to be heard. Too many modern English translations have missed this. We believe that the original autographer were, were inspired by God. But not every translation, certainly the Jehovah's Witness transla translation, the New World translation, is very defective. And not every translation, some translations are better than others and so on. Uh, we don't want to worship a book, we want to worship Christ, who is the message of the book, sure. King James and all of these modern translations have a lot of value. I'm not trying to disparage them. But they have missed it relative to this word Ionius and also the word Olam. Ionius, like the Hebrew equivalent Olam, means lasting. Uh, I have checked 439 uses of Olam in the Old Testament and, and it's, it's a slam dunk that it doesn't mean forever. Uh, you know, Jonah, for example, is supposedly uh, Olam in the belly of the whale. That's ridiculous, everlasting. He wasn't everlasting in, an, in a whale. Jesus said he was there three days and three nights. Yeah, he, it, it was a long time as far as he was concerned. How would you like to be in the belly of a, belly of a fish or a whale uh, for three days and three nights? Uh, he may have passed out and then the Lord revived him somehow when the animal vomited him out onto the beach. Uh, no wonder the people of Nineveh were rather impressed when he came, you know, he had maybe had, had burns all over him, I don't know. Now all three words, Ionius the Greek, Olam the Hebrew, and lasting the English, are durationally indeterminate. Uh, and that's important. But translators have presumed to decide when, uh, in their mind when it should be translated with a temporal word and when it should be translated with an eternal one. They shouldn't make that decision. They should get a word that is equivalent and use it so that the uh, duration is indeterminate, just like the originals. If the Holy Spirit used durational indeterminate words, translators should do likewise. They should not change durational indeterminacy to durational determinacy. 
Now Matthew, for example, used Ionius twice in Matthew 25, 46, and this is one of the main points of objection. Uh, because they say, well, the, the word Ionius is used uh, uh, both times, so and it's certainly I everlasting life, so it must be everlasting punishment. Well, that's wrong. It's lasting life, and lasting doesn't necessarily mean less than everlasting, but we need to translate with equivalency. Both of those words there should be translated lasting. Lasting punishment and lasting life. Both are indeterminate as to duration. Uh, and many people think, uh, therefore, that existence in hell should be durationally equivalent to unending life in heaven, stressing that it's the same word used in both cases. Well, indeed, it is the same word. But the same people who say that may not realize that there's another passage in the New Testament that also uses the word Ionius twice. And, they, and that shows this thinking is in error, because one is certainly not equivalent in duration to the other. Now let's take a look at it. Titus 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of Ionius life. Now should that be eternal life or lasting life, whatever. Which God who never lies promised before Ionius time, before lasting time, uh, it can't be everlasting time because time had a beginning. These two uses in this passage from Titus uh, definitely cannot be durationally equivalent because the future life is indeed unending, but the retrospective view looking back in time cannot possibly be everlasting because time had a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was no time before. Time is a created entity. God is above time, super time. We're in time. But, but he is not. He sees the end from the beginning. <clears throat> so time is something for us to experience. It helps us to understand past, present, and future and all that kind of stuff. But it certainly does not go back unendingly. Moreover, Jesus' teaching also contradicts the everlasting mistranslation in Matthew 25. He explicitly taught that punishment in hell was many or few. Neither of those words mean infinity. And that's in Luke 12. Love Jesus' words in Luke 12 in addition to Matthew 25. He also taught that duration in hell was a, had a terminus. In Matthew 10, 28, let me read it. I'm sorry, uh, uh, well, it says, uh, Fear not the, the one that can destroy the body, but the, the, the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Both may be destroyed, something Plato disputed, and the devil had previously denied. Uh, Eve said, well, in the day that we eat of the tree, we'll die. But, and Satan said, you will not dry, die. In other words, you're immortal, whatever. And that's a lie. Why are we believing a lie? For those who may think that I am denying hell, I am not. I affirm hell because it is revealed in Scripture. Uh, it, but, but the duration of hell is the issue here, not whether hell exists. A lot of people say, oh, he's an uh, what, annihilationist, like maybe the Jehovah's Witness. I reject the Jehovah's Witness, Witness teaching. They deny the deity of Christ. I don't deny the deity of Christ. And, and they maybe deny that hell even exists. I affirm that hell exists. Well, what I'm saying is Jesus taught that it's many and few. He never said unending torment in hell. Nowhere in the whole Bible. So why are we believing it? Fidelity to Jesus and his teachings is important, and he never taught unending conscious torment in hell. But if you look up many, the doctrinal statement of many churches, they'll use that for unending conscious punishment in hell. And it's, it's a traditional view coming from Roman Catholicism, Tertullian, Plato, and so on. The word should not be translated everlasting, it should be translated lasting, durationally neutral, and not specifying the duration. Now, as stated above, many taught above he christ taught many and few moreover luke 12 is not about believers some people will say oh it must be about believers no it isn't 
uh, it is about unbelievers. The Lord also taught the eventual destruction of the soul as well as the body for unbelievers. Notice, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him. Now notice, who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Plato's notion that the soul is immortal is false. Now in his dialogue, now we're switching to Justin Martyr, in his dialogue with Trypho, Justin wrote, but if they, because of the weakness of their mind, and he's talking about Jews, uh, Jewish believers, if they, if they want to, if they desire to keep such of the uh, of the sayings of Moses as are now possible, <clears throat> which we perceive were appointed because of the hardness of people's heart, while they still hope on this Christ of ours, and also desire to keep those ordinances of the practice of righteousness and of piety, which are Ionius. And it was translated everlasting there. It's, the circumcision is not everlasting. Which are and and Justin is not saying it is so to mistranslate it or translate it with the wrong word is not fair to to uh, Justin. Which are onious in accordance with nature and choose to live with Christians and believers as I said before without persuading them either to receive circumcision like themselves or to keep Sabbaths or to observe other things of the same kind. I declare that we must fully uh, receive such and have communion with them in all respects as being of one family with us as brothers. In other words, Jews, okay, if they want to hold on to some of their Jewishness, that's okay, just so long as it crisis focus, and so on and so forth. So in the very context in which he used the word Ionius, it certainly doesn't mean everlasting. He didn't believe that circumcision, for example, was everlasting. The Greek word was translated using everlasting by in this book that I was reading. But Justin, in the very context, shows that he did not believe the ordinance of circumcision was everlasting. And, and Paul was explicit about it, Paul, the Apostle Paul. He says, circumcision profits nothing, and so on. Translations, uh, translators have erred in translating Justin also. He meant lasting, not everlasting, but translators have got, gotten it wrong. In other words, Roman Catholic influence still sticks to evangelical and Roman Protestants as tradition. We haven't extricated ourselves from some of the Catholic poison, and this is part of it. And let's let's uh, let's get rid of it. Let's not be a traditionalist. Let's be originalist. What did Jesus teach? What did the earliest church fathers teach? And uh, you can get my book there. This is dealing with every use of Olam in the Old Testament. It's, I got his, historical perspectives in there and so on. You're welcome to get that. Finally, hell is real punishment, but it is not forever punishment. It is temporal. Everlasting is a mistranslation of the original in Jesus. People maybe want to say, oh, I'm a heretic for not saying it's a... I'm not a heretic. I believe that Jesus Christ is the King of kings, Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, and he is my only hope for salvation. Uh, my writing books doesn't get me into heaven, but I want his words to be respected, Luke 12 and Matthew 10 and so on. Justin's and Polycarp's witness uh, and Jesus' witness ch challenge that traditional perspective. There is, however, a getting out of hell card, to rephrase the language of Monopoly, and his name is Jesus. He took hell so people like you and me could escape. You must repent of all your sins and entrust your whole being to his saving grace. In other words, abandon yourself to Jesus and, like a sheep, experience his enveloping arms of love. Getting out of hell is free for believers, but it was not free for him. If you really love him, don't continue with traditional mistranslations of Ionius and Olan. Now, the lasting Bible to the right is free to anyone. It's, it's, it's available online, free. And it faithfully translates those two words, uh, Ionius and Olam. Um, and uh, it also exists in pa paperback, and that's a copy of it there on the right. And you're free to, call me, uh, to write me at paulhumber at verizon.net. Lord Jesus, use this video for your glory, I pray. And may people love you with all your, their minds, and may they study the word Ionius and Olam and come to the realization 
that they should fake some of the uh, forsake some of the traditionalism that they've been uh, that have stuck to uh, evangelical and reformed Christians and help us to be true and faith. Let me help us to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.